dissolves. Many thanks. And that concludes that item of business. And we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15693 in the name of John Swinney on the Budget of Scotland number five bill. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. I now call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, you have 14 minutes, so thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Budget Scotland number five bill for 2016 17 maintains our strong record of managing the public finances using the fiscal powers currently available to us. It confirms our plans for taxation and expenditure to deliver sustainable economic growth, improve Scotland's public services and to create a fairer and a more prosperous economy with opportunities for all of our citizens to flourish. It is also a historic budget given the context provided by this week's agreement with the United Kingdom Government on the fiscal framework that will support the Scotland Bill. That agreement has significant implications for future Scottish budgets, which the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament will need to consider in the coming months. But let us not forget the significant events that have already occurred in relation to uh, the setting of this particular budget. Two weeks ago, Parliament voted to set the Scottish rate of income tax at 10 pence. This means that the lowest paid taxpayers in our society are protected and that the rate of tax paid by Scottish residents in 2016-17 will be the same as it is today. Our decisions on taxation have been based upon the principles I set out in earlier legislation and are designed to deliver a coherent tax framework for the people of Scotland. The first decision on setting a rate of income tax in Scotland has therefore been one of substance and one that has required me to balance the opportunities and the risks presented by our new tax powers. It has not been a case of making proposals without identifying how they could be implemented uh, without effect on individuals. It has been based on the same approach that I have undertaken when setting all devolved taxes. With Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, the first tax power devolved to this Parliament in over 300 years, I delivered a progressive regime where the UK Government had passed up the opportunity to deliver that reform in the past. However, progressivity in itself is not sufficient justification for increasing the tax burden on the lowest paid taxpayers. Taxes must also be proportionate to the ability to pay, and I stress the ability to pay. It will be of limited reassurance to our pensioners or our newly qualified teachers or our postal workers to know that people in higher salaries will be paying more in increased taxes than they would be as they see their weekly budget come under increased strain. They won't care that others are paying more, they'll care that they are having to pay more. That's not a burden that I am willing to impose in this budget. Instead of increasing the tax burden... Of course, well, on the other side of the coin, we're seeing massive cuts to local authorities. And because of his financial straitjacket, he is now imposing these significant cuts. A senior SNP councillor spoke out today, warning about cuts to music, to school transport, but also to vulnerable children. Is he listening to anybody about these cuts to local authorities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, when I, it's for individual local authorities to take the decisions that they want to take about their budget choices. But Order. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I look at some of the, if I look at some of the examples that Mr Rennie cites in, his, um, in the list that he's just given there, um, these are often the options that are circulated before council meetings, and when councils take their decisions, they reject these options that are put in front of them. And that's exactly what's happened in countless local authorities around the country. I'll give way to Mr Harvey. Uh, I'm Harvey. grateful to the Deputy First Minister for giving way. If it's for local councils to make their own decisions about how to manage these cuts, why isn't it also for local councils to make their own decisions about tax rates that should be set locally? Because the government has a commitment to freeze the council tax for the duration of this parliamentary term and we're determined to ensure that we, we deliver the commitment to the people of Scotland that we gave in the 2011 elections. Governments that keep their promises are respected by the public. Instead of increasing the tax burden, this budget protects household incomes. It provides leadership to employers across the country by ensuring that over 50,000 of Scotland's lowest paid workers receive a pay rise and earn at least the living wage. Uh, of course. Alex Riley. Mr Minister, for giving way. Given that tens of thousands of public sector jobs are going to be lost 
as a result of this budget, regardless of, at the end of the day, whose fault it is. Given that tens of thousands of jobs are going to be lost, will the Deputy First Minister consider setting up an emergency task force to help those people get other jobs? Deputy First Minister. I, um, uh, I frankly think the claims that have been made about public sector employment are utterly exaggerated. That's what I think in this debate. And I'll cite... And I'll, cite, and I'll cite the evidence for Order. that. I'll cite the evidence Order. for that. I'll cite the evidence for that. In the last 12 months, the number of jobs lost in the public sector in Scotland, in the devolved public sector, has been 500. 0.1% 0 .1 of public sector employment, when employment in Scotland has Jackie risen Bailey. by over 20,000 jobs. That is the context I would put on the points that Mr Rowley has raised with me in the debate today. Now, this budget ensures that our older citizens are able to access free personal care in an integrated health and social care system. The tax on ill health that prescription charges represent is abolished saving those with long-term illnesses around £104 a year. Families across the country will benefit from free school meals and 600 hours of early learning and childcare, saving £707 per child per year. And households have their council tax frozen for a ninth consecutive year, saving the average Band D household around £1,550 over the course of this Parliament. And we continue as a government to mitigate the most damaging effects of the UK government's welfare cuts. That's what this government is doing to protect household income in Scotland, and that's what's implicit in the budget before Parliament today. Now, I'll give way to Dr Simpson. Dr Simpson, it's ready. I just wonder what he feels about the Clackmanager SNP budget, which was passed last week, which imposed a 7.1% cut on every single third sector organisation, primarily supporting self-management uh, in, in health conditions, but also children. Do th if you take into account RPI at 1.3%, that's in real terms a cut of 8.4%. Is that the sort of budget cuts he does approve? Mr Swin. Well, what, 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 I would say, what I would say to Dr Simpson is that individual local authorities must make their choices within the resources available to them. But I am also entitled to insist upon the need to freeze the council tax, about the need to invest in health and social care and its integration with £250 million of new investment. Is Dr Simpson against that investment that the government has made available and also ensuring that the government takes steps to protect the delivery of education at local authority level, to which I now come in my uh, remarks? Education lies at the heart of the government's inclusive growth agenda and is central to our efforts to tackle inequality and to improve educational outcomes. Under this government, 607 schools have been replaced or refurbished. That's nearly a quarter of the whole school estate. We've introduced free school meals for children in primaries one to three, benefiting almost 130,000 pupils and saving families important resources. Our young people achieved a record number of higher and advanced higher passes in 2015, and the number leaving school for a positive destination in education, employment or training is now at a record high of 93%. And almost 11,000 more students successfully completed full-time college courses, leading to recognised qualifications in 2014-15 than in 2008-9, an increase of 24%. And this year, Record numbers of Scots have applied to go to university here and 18-year-olds from our most deprived communities are now 65% more likely to apply than they were in 2006. And the percentage of newly qualified teachers in employment after the probation period has increased. That's the effect of the government's investment in education. We've not scrapped the education maintenance allowance. We've expanded it, enabling more young people from low-income families to stay on at school or at college. We've not scrapped maintenance grants for the poorest students. We've increased the level of the bursary. We've not scrapped disabled students' allowance. We're continuing to provide this vital support. And we've not made and will never make education dependent on the ability to pay. No front door tuition fees, no back door taxes. We'll keep tuition free, saving 120,000 students in Scotland up to £27,000 over the course of their degree. I'll have to make some more uh, progress. 
But we know there's much more that we need to do. We want to create a world-class education system which delivers success for all of our children. Our overall aim is to raise standards everywhere, but to raise them most in the areas that need it most. As the First Minister has indicated on several occasions, action in this area is an absolute priority for the Government. We previously announced the four-year £100 million Attainment Scotland Fund to support schools in our poorest neighbourhoods to raise attainment. It's now about to enter its second year of operation, and over the next three years we still have £80 million of the fund to spend. I've looked at this carefully. I've considered the resources that I have available, including my latest assessment of forecast receipts from the devolved taxes. And I've decided that we are in a position to do more than I had already planned to do. I can today confirm to Parliament that I intend to double the amount of funding that we had planned to allocate to the Attainment Scotland Fund over the next three years, taking that fund from £80 million to a total of £160 million. <laughs> Ministerial, ministerial colleagues will announce further details in due course, but I would hope that all members in this chamber will welcome the substantial additional investment in measures to help ensure that every child has the opportunity to realise their potential. Uh, of course. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way on that point. On the attainment money, can he confirm that every local authority who has allocated a certain amount of money will receive all of that money and there is not this technical um, ambiguity that it must be drawn down, that they will receive all of the money that he allocates to them for attainment? First Minister. Well, uh, I, I, I can Order. give Jenny Mara that, uh, the assurance that authorities that are allocated the money will get the money that they're allocated. But what we'll do is we'll focus it. I actually thought that might be an intervention from Jenny Mara, welcoming the fact the government was increasing investment on the children that need it the most. But I suppose that would be just a little bit too much to hope for on a Wednesday afternoon in Parliament. The budget doesn't just lay the foundations for our children's future. But this government will continue to invest heavily in Scotland's infrastructure, using all the levers at our disposal to maximise investment and to support economic growth in Scotland. At the same time, we will continue to offer a competitive advantage for the majority of business ratepayers within the United Kingdom. I have reflected on feedback from a number of businesses and can confirm today to Parliament that I have moderated the adjustment to the level of relief available for empty industrial properties proposed in the draft budget. 100% relief will now be available for six months rather than three months as originally proposed. And I will also extend the fresh start and new start reliefs for the duration of 2016-17. Finally, I look forward to the forthcoming review of business rates, which will be detailed shortly, and the opportunity that provides to test our business rate policies to continue to support investment and growth. The Government is committed to protect our public services and to pursue ambitious reform to help ensure that public services meet the needs of the people of Scotland. The Budget contains a series of measures to demonstrate our further commitment to extend digital applications in public services. We will invest £250 million to deliver the most significant reform to health and social care since the creation of the National Health Service in 1948. We will invest a further £200 million over the next five years in six new elective treatment centres. And as well as maintaining 1,000 additional police officers, the frontline police resource budget will be protected in real terms, and we have allocated further funding to support continued reform. And we will continue to prioritise the preventative interventions across all of our services uh, by building on the success to date of the Early Years Collaborative. These are the measures the Government will take to support the sustainability of the public services. I welcome the agreement of Scotland's local authorities to the financial settlement that we are providing, which, when taken together as a package of funding, will enable them to increase the pace of reform and improve essential public services to communities all over the country. As we debate the priorities in the Budget today, Presiding Officer, we do so over a changing financial landscape where this Parliament will, in the years to come, acquire even greater responsibilities to exercise fiscal flexibility. The Scottish Government will set out its priorities in that respect before Parliament rises for the election campaign. But the budget before Parliament today establishes very strong foundations for the delivery of public services, for the achievement of sustainable economic growth and to ensure that the priorities of the people of Scotland are delivered by the Government of Scotland. I move the budget. Many thanks. 
I now call on Kezia Dugdale. Ms Dugdale, 10 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer. And yesterday was a historic day for this Parliament. <laughs> the, deal on the, fiscal Order. Framework, the deal on the fiscal framework has ushered in a new and exciting era of devolution. And I congratulate the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister on their efforts in that regard. The new powers that we have bring in an age of responsibility. Not just the responsibility to govern well, but the responsibility to use those powers to do things differently and to offer real change. And after a day of congratulation and consensus comes a day of decision. This is the big choice that will define Scottish politics because we are faced with the choice between using our powers or continuing with failed Tory policies. And the Labour Party will choose to use our powers. Today we will oppose this austerity budget and we do so not in a spirit of oppositionalism but in the spirit of a new powerful parliament. Order. We do so in the spirit of a new powerful parliament with a positive alternative. Yeah, yeah. Setting the Scottish rate of income tax one pence higher than the rate set by George Osborne. No thank you, I'd like to make a bit more progress. This is a parliament that has so often heard arguments from all sides about what we can't do and what we shouldn't do. Today, again, I stand to say what we can do and what we should do. More than that, I'll argue what we must do. Since I put forward the alternative to austerity 22 days ago, some things have become clearer. First, let me make a bit more progress. First, it is beyond any reasonable doubt that this is a fair policy. Let's look at the facts. It is simply a fact that low earners will be protected from this. Ms. Kez, Ms. Dugdale is not giving way at the moment, it appears. Yeah. Allow her to make some progress. Say to Mr. Stewart that he should listen to the facts before he ignores them anyway. <laughs> Because analysis from SPICE shows that out of every pound raised by this measure, 92 pence will come from the top half of earners. Two thirds come from the top 20% of earners. And those SNP MSPs who told us that an entirely new state could be established in 18 months now tell us that a simple flat rate payment of 100 pounds could not be paid until the new powers come in. Mr. Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, we have yet to hear from the Labour Party, after many, many requests, how that rebate scheme is actually going to work. Maybe Ms. Dugdale today can outline exactly how that is going to work, or is she willing to take the gamble of making the poorest in our society pay for their mistake and being unable to deliver Thank you, that Mr rebate Stewart. Scheme. Point made. Ms Dugdale, please continue. Order from the rest of you. There we go, presiding officer. They tell us it's all too difficult. It can't be done. Council leader after council leader have come yeah. out and told yeah. us that this can be done. Union leader after union leader has said that it is fair. And can I say to them, can I say to them, the expert analysis shows that because of the changes to the personal allowance, even before our £100 payment, even if you accept that such a simple thing for a single year is all too difficult, even then, no one earning under £90,000 a year will pay a penny more in tax next year than they did this year. Mr. IPPR, Swinney. the University of Stirling, the Resolution Foundation, the House of Commons Library all confirmed that the richest would pay a higher amount in percentage terms and in cash terms. That is a progressive policy. First Minister. Moment, I can assume she manages to get the £100 to low income households. Can she confirm today will any of that £100 be clawed back in tax or tax credits? It's a simple question. Can we get a simple answer? Is it a drug deal? 
it's quite clear that it's protected from tax. And I would also say to the First Minister, hey, look at the experts. I look Order. And I say to Order. the First Minister that come 2017, she will have the power to do this. Is she still opposed to it? Is it the detail or is it the principle? Order, Mr Dale, would you sit down for one second, please? Um, I wish to say to the Chamber, Mr Swinney was heard in almost perfect silence. Please can we extend the same courtesy to Ms Dugdale. Ms Dugdale, please proceed. Such is the weight of evidence that those searching for reasons to oppose our plans now scrabble in the dirt for excuses not to do the right thing. Each time this has been raised in this Parliament, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister told low-paid workers that the lowest paid will pay more than higher earners. For them to do this, when they know that the richest will pay more than 100 times more than the lower paid, is beneath the office that they hold. It betrays any claim they make to support progressive taxes. It is just plain wrong. Presiding officer, the second thing that is now beyond doubt is that this budget is going to inflict unnecessary pain on every community in Scotland. Almost unbelievably, the Deputy First Minister told this Parliament that the cuts in this budget will have a minimal impact. He need only read the front pages of any local newspaper, talk to any teacher. He could have bothered to go out and speak to the hundreds of trade unionists who assembled outside this parliament at lunchtime today. To understand how utterly divorced from reality that position has become. Because the terrible toll of these cuts is there in black and white in the budgets being passed with heavy, heavy hearts by local councillors of all political colours. And here are some of those choices. 170 jobs were lost in Angus this week. This week, Clackmannanshire will consider cutting 350 posts. Highland, 282 on Thursday. Across Scotland, thousands of workers losing their jobs. Cleaners, supply teachers, early year staff. Libraries closing in Fife, Aberdeen. School librarians sacked in Argyll and Butte. The number halved in Clackmannanshire. English and maths teachers cut. Classroom assistants lost in Falkirk. Support assistants lost in Edinburgh. In the Deputy First Minister's own backyard, they've already cut educational psychologists for vulnerable children and families with additional support needs, with more cuts around the country. Terrible. They can put whatever spin they want on these cuts. They can rename them, they can rebadge them, they can even reprofile them. But they cannot deny that these cuts are real and that they are painful. The final thing that has been clear since the start of this budget process is that our proposal is the only alternative to these cuts. Why? Because we cannot escape the responsibility of the choice we are faced with. Will we use our powers, the powers we came together to demand, or will we accept cuts? Scottish Labour cannot in good conscience do anything other than argue to use those powers. It is now for others to search their own conscience. Every single MSP on the SNP benches promised their electorate they would oppose austerity and offer an alternative to George Osborne. <laughs> Yet today, for the third and final time in this budget process, they will unite with the Tories, not to end Osborne's cuts, but to enforce George Osborne's cuts. This is from a party that was elected on the basis of one very simple argument. Nicola Sturgeon made her name on this particular argument, that more powers means different decisions from the Tories. Now finds itself applauded by the Tories for delivering these cuts. And I ask every SNP MSP, is this what you were elected for? When low-income workers will not be a penny worse off, when they will actually be better off? When every single expert agrees that this is a progressive policy? When thousands of workers are losing their jobs, workers they made a promise to? When staff are being sacked in our schools in their own constituencies? Why is there not even one free thinker in the SNP who will support us as we bring forward the thing they have always claimed that they support? Today, together, we can do something no one else in the UK has the opportunity to do. We can vote to end austerity. 
Simply by pressing a button, SNP MSPs can join with Labour MSPs and they can end austerity this year today. And I say this to them. What you told voters you wanted is here in front of you. We have handed it to you. Take it. Use our new powers. Don't leave them on the shelf. Stop these cuts, save these jobs and invest in Scotland's future. Very nice. I now call on Murder Fraser. Mr Fraser, you have six minutes, please. Can I start, uh, Deputy Planning Officer, by welcoming two announcements from the uh, Deputy First Minister this afternoon. We welcome the additional funding uh, for the uh, Attainment Fund for Education, although we would question once again why the Scottish Government persists in using the Scottish Index for multiple deprivation rather than measures which identify all the children in need of support wherever they might live. The money surely should follow the children, not a postcode. And secondly, we welcome the movement there has been on empty property relief for industrial properties. The Cabinet Secretary will know this is an issue I raised with him during budget discussions and does reflect widespread concern in the business community. Deputy Presiding Officer, the background to this year's budget has been somewhat different to what we have been used to in the past. We have had the fiscal framework discussions happening at the same time, discussions which I'm delighted to see have now been successfully concluded. And secondly, the debate around the budget has been dominated, as we've heard, by the setting for the first time of the Scottish rate of income tax. This debate around tax rates is both welcome and refreshing, and a taste of things to come as this Parliament acquires more powers and responsibility in future. On the question of tax, I set out the Scottish Conservative view during the Stage 1 debate three weeks ago, and our view hasn't changed. We don't believe people in Scotland should be taxed more highly than those in the rest of the United Kingdom. And I'm delighted that that principle is one which seems to be shared not just by this party, but by those on the government benches who are happy to join with the Scottish Conservatives in a new taxpayers' alliance, <laughs> working hand in glove to protect hard-pressed Scottish families against the tax grabbers in Labour and the Liberal Democrats. But I do wish, presiding officer, that those on the SNP benches who oppose these plans for hiking income tax would have the courage of their convictions and not hide behind the detail of Labour's proposals. It has been a part of the SNP narrative that Labour's plans are not progressive, something which is, to be fair, contradicted by independent commentaries from the likes of the IPPR and the Resolution Foundation. So I would encourage SNP members to oppose Labour's tax grab, not on the detail, but on the principle, for in doing so, they will have the public on their side. An Ipsos Mori opinion poll conducted this month showed that the number of Scots who believe that taxes in Scotland should be set at the same or a lower rate than the rest of the United Kingdom is 64%, yeah. as against a mere 30% who feel they should be higher. By a factor of more than two to one, Scots oppose higher taxes here. So the SNP should stand firm with us and be confident in their argument. Yeah. We are on the people's side. Yeah. And when it comes to tax, the Scottish Conservatives speak for Scotland. Now, while we welcome the Scottish Government's approach on tax, this is only one aspect of the budget. As I set out in the Stage 1 debate, there are other elements of the budget which we feel are profoundly damaging. Our overall approach has been to promote measures that we believe would benefit the Scottish economy, not just because a strong economy and providing jobs is important in itself, but because of the growing link that there will be between our future economic performance and the tax income that will come to the Scottish Government. And I set out in the Stage 1 debate a number of concerns we had about the budget as proposed. The increase in non-domestic rates with the doubling of the large business supplement, which will hit many relatively modest businesses, seems to fly in the face of everything we've heard from the First Minister and indeed everything we've heard this afternoon from the Deputy First Minister about making Scotland the most competitive part of the UK in which to do business. We raised previously concerns about the changes to empty property relief to end the exemption of industrial property. The Cabinet Secretary has moved in some direction, but there will still be concerns about the impact of that. We continue to have concerns about LBTT, where the evidence shows that the collection rates for domestic properties are well below the Scottish Government's projections, and we believe that the Cabinet Secretary needs to revisit his figures to ensure that the tax take from that proposal is actually more in line with the original projections. We have concerns about the cut in the Help to Buy funding by £50 million, given the value of this scheme in extending the benefit of home ownership and helping stimulate the construction sector. 
We have persistently over the years been opposed to cuts in college funding, which will now see a fall of 152,000 college places. And we have asked for an additional £60 million in funding to reverse these cuts. And while the SNP will argue that this is mostly part-time courses which have been affected, we should not forget that for many working people looking to upskill, often returners to work, such as women who have taken time out to have children, these part-time courses are absolutely essential. And we should regret the impact on our economy from cutting them. And we propose other changes which would have limited financial implications, asking for the school attainment fund uh, to be funded in a different way, doubling the funding for Community Broadband Scotland, restoration of the annual grant to the Scottish Association of Young Farmers Clubs, and for a review of local government funding allocations. This last point being particularly important given the unfairness facing councils in the North East, which with the decline in the oil and gas sector and the additional pressures that's putting on council services in that part of the country is all the more acute. Presiding officer, I had the opportunity to meet the Cabinet Secretary two weeks ago to present our proposals and I thank him for his time. I am disappointed, however, that there has not been more movement on the key issues which we have outlined. We should be putting the growth of the Scottish economy at the forefront of government policy. Yeah. And accordingly, while we do support the setting of the Scottish rate of income tax at 10%, we cannot support the budget as it stands. We fear that the Cabinet Secretary's proposals will be damaging to the Scottish economy and in the long run, will actually cost us tax revenue. Deputy Presiding Officer, a Conservative budget would seek to grow the economy, reduce barriers to business growth, invest in further education, and by expanding our economy, widen the tax base and increase the tax take. This is not the budget we have before us today. And accordingly, we will this afternoon vote against the budget at decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate. I call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Tight for time this afternoon, up to six minutes, please, Mr Macdonald. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And it was very interesting to watch some of the colour draining on the Labour benches as they realised that their pre-prepared line about the SNP budget being backed by the Tories had just been torpedoed by Murdo Fraser. And in fact, it will be the Labour Party once again joining forces to vote with the Conservative Party in this chamber. <laughs> Not, not just now, Mr Macdonald, I want to move on. I want to move on. You, you, you may want to listen a little bit further because I would have thought that Kezia Dugdale might have learned her lesson previously about using Aberdeen City Council as an example in this chamber, uh, but she hasn't. And she stood up and said that libraries are closing in Aberdeen, which will come as news to people in Aberdeen because the council budget doesn't get set until tomorrow. Oh. But furthermore, it will come as news to the administration in Aberdeen because when I read in the Evening Express of that very same proposal about the officers proposing that libraries could close, I read very clearly in that article that the finance convener of Aberdeen City Council, Willa Young, said that he would fight against that proposal when it came into the council chamber. So either, so either Willa Young is going to lose the fight within his own group and the administration are going to press ahead with this, or Kezia Dugdale is coming to this chamber, putting forward a proposal that officers have suggested to councillors, but that the administration are not going to accept and has used it as a means to yet again, yet again imply something that is not going to happen. It's little wonder, it's little wonder, presiding officer, that Kezia Dugdale on television yesterday gave up on winning the election and said she was Order. going to settle for second calm, place please. in May. <laughs> presiding officer, during recess week, during recess week, I visited Stonywood School in my constituency. Uh, it was a school that in 2008 I campaigned as a local councillor alongside the parent council and the local community to keep open. I made the argument at the time that the school role would increase as housing development took place and that there would be a need for a new school building. And the reason for my visit was that rather than it being closed, plans are now in place for a new school building, plans that have been facilitated through the use of Scottish Government money through the Schools for the Future programme, a very welcome investment in my constituency and a welcome investment for the pupils and community of Stonywood, standing alongside other schools in my constituency which have benefited significantly through new buildings buildings being put in place. And, there, and there's a reason why that is important beyond simply the fabric uh, of, of the building. 
a, building, uh, a new school building uh, a new, built through capital has a revenue impact in terms of it being uh, more cost effective to heat, light and maintain. That frees up revenue spending that very often is spent lighting, heating and maintaining buildings that are no longer fit for purpose and allows that revenue to instead be put towards frontline services. That's an important element of why the Schools for the Future programme is important beyond creating fit for purpose, first class accommodation for our education system. In terms of health and social care integration, the, the money that the Scottish Government is putting toward this is very important. I've spoken to a number of uh, health care workers and social care workers in my constituency over the last few weeks, and one of the things that they've said is that they believe that bringing the, the, the two services closer together and removing some of the gaps that exist within the system is fundamental if we're going to improve the care that is provided to our vulnerable citizens. In terms of bed blocking or delayed discharge, this is exceptional important. Yes. Many of us in this chamber are dealing with constituents who at the moment are unable to exit uh, hospital for, uh, because there are, there's an inability to get appropriate care packages put in place. Increasing uh, the integration between health and social care, removing some of the silo mentality that exists and also uh, paying a living wage to care workers and making it a more attractive opportunity for individuals to go into that line of work are all key to removing uh, some of those barriers. Uh, the delayed discharge uh, rate in Aberdeen was zero when I was a member of the council administration. It has crept upwards since then. I believe that there are some policy changes that have taken place at a local level which have uh, stymied some of the progress that was made. But I believe that the approach that is being taken just now will assist in reversing that a very unwelcome trend. I'll take a brief intervention from Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I'm sure all of us can identify specific elements of any budget that are welcome, but surely he's not asking the Chamber to believe that everything is rosy in the garden and that there will be no cuts to local services as a result of this budget. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where in my speech uh, Patrick Harvey drew that inference, but what I've said repeatedly... <laughs> What I've, what I've said repeatedly, uh, and I quoted the leader of my own local authority, who said that the savings that they were expected to make in Aberdeen City Council would be able to be absorbed without an impact on frontline services and on jobs. So if they're able to make that uh, saving, I can only quote what the leader of the council herself is saying publicly on this issue. I've taken one intervention and I've only got 40 seconds left. Um, but what we also see in the northeast of Scotland is a drive towards improved infrastructure. The AWPR being pushed forward, the real improvements to the northeast of Scotland again being pushed forward, the new schools being delivered. But one of the things that I think is absolutely fundamental is the doubling of the attainment fund, which will benefit schools in my constituency and schools across Scotland in reducing the gap that exists too often between some of our most deprived communities and some of our more better off communities. That is exceptionally welcome funding and it's why I will be happy to support the budget this evening. Many thanks and thanks for your brevity. Now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Willie Rennie. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And at five o'clock today, John Swinney is going to ask this Parliament to vote to cut public services right across Scotland. The Finance Secretary has decided that what the Scottish people need right now is for the SNP to take £500 million from local authority budgets in every part of this country. And Mr Swinney can be in no doubt what this means. He knows what this means because every single Labour councillor has told him so directly. And I suspect quite a few SNP councillors have done so too, those with some backbone, that is. This SNP budget will mean cuts to our kids' education, cuts to old people's services and cuts to disability support. Cosla have told them this will mean 15,000 jobs. That's the equivalent of closing the Tata steel mill 50 times over. And can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, I was very surprised to hear him say that the job losses have been exaggerated. Can I ask him exactly, has he made an assessment on jobs of his budget cuts? And if so, can he tell me exactly how many job losses does he predict his cuts will cause? The Cabinet Secretary has decided not just to ignore the voice of locally elected councillors, he has deliberately decided to leave those councillors with no choice, no ability to raise finance locally, no freedom to vary spending on most areas nominally under local control. Mr Swinney has ordered them to sign in the dotted line or lose hundreds of millions of pounds more in centrally imposed SNP government penalties. John Swinney has given our public authorities 
no choice but to cut services, but he has a choice. He has a choice because Scottish Labour have given him one. The SNP has a choice to ask those who can afford it to pay a little more or they can ask or tell those who need it to make do with a lot less. That's the choice facing the SNP at decision time today. Do they use the powers of this parliament to shape a different future for this country or do they side with the Tories and vote for austerity across Scotland? Yes, the Taxpayers' Alliance. That's right, the Taxpayers' Alliance yet again. Presiding officer, we often talk in this parliament about our supposed Order. progressive majority. While many MSPs seem to share a common agenda built around the pursuit of a fairer and more caring society, we express our beliefs in terms of support for a publicly run NHS, good schools for all, a progressive and broadly redistributive tax system. And of course, in supposedly vocal opposition to conservative welfare reforms and austerity cuts. Well, many MSPs may talk like progressives, and here's one right now, President Officer, but when it comes to action, the SNP have been found wanting. Yes. I thank Mr. Matintosh for giving way. He's normally a pretty honest bloke when I've come across him before. Could he give us a very simple understanding of how the Labour rebate scheme would work to ensure uh, that those poorer folk who are paying tax would actually benefit from that rebate? McIntosh. Well, Mr Stewart, as usual, steps right up when I need him most because the SNP have fallen back on weasel words and excuses. And as usual, and as usual, and Mr. as Stewart, usual, that's enough. Thank you, Mr. Officer. As usual, the backbenchers have been issued with their crib sheets. <laughs> and, oh, yes, well, Mr. Stewart just read from his, as usual. And what is the first excuse we've just heard from Mr Stewart? It's to avoid talking about tax at all. And to pretend that if only the SNP were to be given more detail about Labour's rebate for low earners, they might actually vote for it. It's a pretense. It's the, we can't even do it. We don't even have the powers to excuse. And if I may say so, presiding officer, we've heard that one many, many times before. Do you remember the bedroom tax? For a year or more, Labour and campaigners across Scotland campaigned across Scotland to argue the SNP should use their powers, use its budget to mitigate, and all we heard was we can't even do it. Until that is, of course, Mr Swinney himself gave the game away, pointing out that he could allocate the budget, but he didn't want to let the UK government off the hook. Then it all began to unravel. But what's the second excuse and weasel word we're hearing? Well, this one is more worrying, because frankly, it is more deceitful. It is to try to scare people on low to middle incomes that the tax proposal is going to clobber them. Just to be clear, Mr. Officer, Labour are proposing a one pence rise in income tax, and only for those earning over £20,000 a year, that's one pence in the pound from 20 pence to 21 pence. And I think in anyone's language, in anyone's language, that's a 1% Mr. Stevenson. Rise. The SNP are Members deliberately trying minute. to mislead people by calling it a 5% rise. A 5% rise, that is utterly shameful. And to give you an example, presenting officer, Claire Adamson, is she here today? Claire Adamson, in her, in her contribution to the debate on the Scottish rate of income tax on February 11th said, what are the lowest paid people in society to do in the months it would take for the Labour Party to implement a 5% slash in their income? Well, can I ask Ms Adamson, or if she hasn't got the time, Mr Swinney, to apologise on her behalf. Ms Adamson, please apologise for that misleading statement. Yeah, you've talked Ms. a lot Adamson, about weasel words. Here's a dictionary definition. A rebate is an amount paid by way of reduction, return or refund on what has already been paid or contributed. So tell the Scottish people, Mr McIntosh, how long do they have to wait from when that money is removed from their pay packets to when Labour That's are going enough. to pay it Thank back you. in? Because Mr. you McIntosh, simply don't will know. Will you finish now, please? <laughs> please finish. 20 seconds. Ms. Adamson, Ms. Adamson either is ignorant of her own remarks 
or is clearly, clearly trying to deceive the Scottish public by talking about a 5% cut in income. Presiding officer, this is about austerity. Do we choose austerity or do we make a Labour's choice to use the powers for a better future for Scotland? Thank you. Right. Now call on Willie Rennie. Up to six minutes, Mr Rennie, please, to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank, thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's quite interesting just observing the benches here on the SNP. Desperate, utterly desperate to find an excuse. <laughs> utterly... Utterly desperate to find an Order. excuse Please allow Mr. not Rennie to, to, act to save public services. The laughing, the clapping, the enthusiasm from these benches when they have somehow found out a way not to increase taxation. We have spent how many years in this Parliament arguing for more powers through the Calman Commission and our commissions, the Steel Commission, the Campbell Commission, before that setting up this Parliament with all the powers. And today we get the big chance, the big chance to use those powers, to do something about it with the urgent need of services to public authorities. We have seen SNP councillors speaking out, desperate, no, not just now, desperate to find ways of stopping the cuts to local authorities. And these people laugh and clap because they found a way of answering that question. If they were serious, about dealing with the question of cuts to local authorities. They would not laugh and they would not clap because they would be desperately hunting for a way to save public services, but they are not. They are more desperate, more desperate to talk as if they are left, but they walk right every single day. The language they use of tax grabbers, of tax, is theft is almost the language that is used. I mean, we've heard from the Conservative benches, they are absolutely delighted that you now agree with them. But in reality, we are facing massive cuts to local authorities. Now, I welcome the decision by John Swinney today over his attainment fund. I think that is welcome. I however think it is window dressing on a budget that is slashing public services to the core education budgets. It's half of what local authorities do. They are going to be slashed. There is no way of avoiding it. And we'll see the harsh reality of John Swinney's cuts that are coming forward in the next few weeks. He has put a straitjacket around local authorities, a £408 million straitjacket around them. These are now his responsibility. Every single cut to local authorities could have been avoided if John Swinney had made the decision and given them the flexibility, no, the flexibility to make a different decision. My priority for now is to propose a penny on income tax for education. It's a costly proposal, as we put forward in every single budget and have done in every single budget of this Parliament. It's a costly proposal. It will deliver £475 million worth of investment. And the reasons are quite simple. Scottish education is slipping down the International League in performance. We used to have one of the best education systems in the world, and it is now slipping down. 152,000 college places have been lost. We've got £500 million worth of cuts coming to local authorities. So the situation is urgent. That's why we need to invest a penny on education. And what we'll get is investment in colleges, investment in schools or the pupil premium, but also stopping the cuts that are coming, and an investment in nursery education. The best educational investment that we can make. And the proposal is progressive, thanks to the fact that we in government raised the tax threshold up to £11,000. It now means that someday we'd have to earn over £19,000 to pay more tax next year in comparison with this year. Somebody in £100,000 will pay 30 times as much as somebody in the median wage. I think that's reasonable, fair and progressive. And what the SNP members ignore is the social benefits, the economic benefits we will get from stopping the cuts coming. The people who will lose their jobs as a result of these cuts will see no benefit to John Swinney proclaiming his protection 
of low-income taxpayers. Here they will see no benefit because they will not be paying any tax at all. They will be on the dole. That is the consequence of John Swinney's budget. So those are our priorities. A penny on income tax for education, to invest in schools, to invest in nurseries and to invest in colleges. We have raised in my letter to John Swinney this year, we raised a number of different issues to do with GP recruitment, the Keep Well campaign that the RCN have raised, the superfast broadband, which um, Murdo Fraser also referred to, the house building rate. But there was one particular issue that I wanted John Swinney uh, to try and resolve. It's a small amount of money, but it would, I believe, have a great social benefit to society. And that is his budget cut to the um, alcohol and drug partnerships. Um, the budget for them is only £70 million, and he's proposing to take away £15 million of that budget. It's a small amount of money, but the investment that we can make in drug rehabilitation pays dividends in communities. Anybody who lives in a community that is blighted by drugs knows the consequences of that. So we're going in the wrong direction on drug rehabilitation. And I would urge John Swinney, it's a small amount of money, but it will deliver a big benefit for those communities and those people that are affected by it. So a penny for education is my priority. But I would also urge John Swinney to look at the drug rehabilitation budget. Thank you. Thank you. Call John McAlpine to be followed by Drew Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I seem to recall that the Liberal Democrats were propping up uh, the Tories in 2011 when they raised VAT from 17.5% to 20%. So yeah. I think we should see Willie Rennie's comments in that context, context given that VAT is the least progressive tax of all. Uh, I want to begin by welcoming uh, uh, the commitment to inflation-busting rises uh, for the NHS in this budget. Um, a record investment of £13 billion can't have been easy to achieve, given the £3.9 billion to Scotland's overall budget cut by um, the UK Government between 2010 and 2020. Um, I wish to concentrate particularly on the £250 million allocation to speed the integration of health and social care. It's a historic move which should change the way we deliver care to frail people who neither want nor need to be in hospital. Sometimes these are young people with a life-changing illness or a learning disability. Sometimes they're terminally ill. Often they're frail elderly people with multiple conditions who nevertheless wish to enjoy life at home or at the very least in a supportive residential setting that feels like home. And this £250 million is for them. It will deliver the care they need and, crucially, it will mean that this care is delivered by workers who are properly rewarded by the living wage. Uh, happy workers who are fairly recompensed tend to remain in post for longer. And for patients, this, means results, uh, this results in the continuity of care, uh, which is so important uh, to vulnerable people uh, who require help with very personal tasks. And that is why I welcome the Deputy First Minister's clear instruction that this £250 million should be used in part to pay the living wage to home care workers. It's particularly timely, uh, presiding officer. The Economy Committee, of which I'm a member, recently finished an inquiry into fair work and we took evidence from the care sector. Uh, the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland told us that recruitment costs in the care sector amount to £3,500 for each new worker and that staff turnover is high. And Duncan White of the UK Home Care Association estimated the staff turnover at 38%. Uh, meanwhile, yes, I will. Professor Brennan. Thank you. I wonder what, if we could have your uh, views on the situation in Dundee. With it. Obviously, the SNP administration at Dundee have one of their proposals is, is to cut uh, home care services, actually reprofiling or reconfiguring it, and it's got £250,000 cut from home care. And actually, at a public meeting with you need to hurry the, along. Yeah, sorry, with a public meeting with the finance <coughs> convener from the SNP, they were they were saying about the bullying 
The John, Ma John McAlpine. Home care. Yeah, I, I don't think that was a question. John McAlpine. Presiding, I don't think that was a question, presiding officer. Um, uh, to continue, uh, the Social Services Council in Scotland highlighted the impact low-paying work can have on service users and patients, and it said to the inquiry, low pay can exacerbate staff turnover issues and ultimately affect the ability to provide continuity of care. A continuous caring relationship with an identified professional can be particularly important in many instances, particularly when supporting an individual with dementia. And to illustrate the importance of this 250 million, I want to tell a story about a constituent who called me a couple of years ago in a state of extreme distress. Um, the constituent's father was back at home, having suffered from a devastating uh, stroke. He desperately wanted to be at home. His family desperately wanted to, him to be at home. But the local authority claimed that he couldn't be provided with a care package that he had been assessed as requiring. And there was actually pressure to put this man back into hospital, something that would have resulted him in, in him being extremely distressed and would have affected his rehabilitation. After, I've already taken an intervention. I may, need to make progress. If it was anything like the last one, it wouldn't be worth my while anyway. Yeah, um, the local authority was resistant to doing, to doing this for this man because they didn't want to foot the bill. And this 250 million social care packages should end distress such as this cost to my constituent and his family. It'll be money well spent. And it's exactly the sort of change that we, we all signed up to to support the 2020 vision of the NHS. It's an exam, excellent example of preventative spend, which was the recommendation of the Christie Commission, the principles of which were supported by every party in this chamber. We have a mass of expert evidence, presiding officer, that this is the kind of shift in resources that we require. The Scottish Government's expert group report on uh, the effects of delayed discharge notes that unnecessary time spent in hospital can not only lead to a significant deterioration in the person's physical and mental health, but this in turn will lead to the greater use of institutional care at a higher cost to local authorities. And the BMA has noted that staying in hospital for unnecessary amounts of time increases the risk of infection, depression, loss of independence, and of course increases the inappropriate use of NHS resources. So I just wanted to turn back to um, the uh, concluding presiding officer, the comments of one social care worker in Glasgow to the inquiry, um, who said it's a wonderful job, it's a privilege to support those less fortunate to try and attain uh, fruitful lives. It's a vocational job with long unsociable hours, often fraught with the threat of violence. And it seems you have to wear a uniform to have the credibility, such as nurses, doctors, police, etc., while it's often social care that fills the gaps for these professions. You must Pay attention close. to the area. One day you will be using it. Mr Swinney has paid attention to social care in this budget. And as a result, many vulnerable people in this country will benefit. You must uh, close, I'd like please. to congratulate him and support this budget, which gets its priorities right. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is no extra time in this debate. Please take interventions within your six minutes. Drew Smith to be followed by Ken Gibson. I'm grateful, President Officer. I think others have already made the point that this budget debate is probably the most important that this parliament has had since it was established some 17 years ago. And during that devolution referendum, the people of Scotland endorsed two principles, firstly a parliament and secondly a parliament with the ability to vary income tax. In 1999, John Swinney and his colleagues were elected on the promise that they would use the variable rate as then was to raise a penny for Scotland. That was at a time of rising investment in public services by the then Labour government. Three years later, John Swinney, as leader of the SNP, dropped that policy, saying Gordon Brown has increased taxes and has put more money into the public purse. I'm now not sure if that was meant as a complaint. Today we find ourselves in a situation where two of the three largest parties, Labour and the SNP, are opposed to the UK Chancellor's ideological pursuit of austerity in the smaller state. The third party, the Scottish Conservatives, of course, support that approach and they can put their case at the election. But since the election of the first coalition and now the current Government, both Labour and SNP have been in broad agreement that the economic approach is wrong. Austerity means cuts to vital public services and a burden of pain which has been borne not by those with the broadest shoulders but by those most reliant upon public services. Those who work in public services and their redundancies certainly are not being exaggerated, Deputy First Minister. Barely a question time goes by where government backbenchers don't invite Scottish ministers to blame the cuts that are taking place in Scottish communities today on the United Kingdom Government. 
Scottish ministers have, in all fairness to them, been consistent in calling for an alternative. They have also been consistent in the demand for more powers for Scotland, and have asserted again consistently that any new powers would be used to combat austerity and defend the most vulnerable against the cuts. Calling for power, promising to use power, but little evidence of real shifts in spending to protect the services which are now most at risk. Because many of those services are provided by Scottish local government, services provided by Labour and SNP councils alike. COSLA says these cuts are wholly misguided and threaten grievous injury to communities. John Swinney says they are just exaggerating. The deal that members here complain about from the UK is in fact made worse and then passed on to Scottish communities by, by decisions taken here in Scotland's Parliament. MSPs present in this debate today are some of the first to then criticise local government for the cuts which they are voting for here today. That is wrong, President Officer, and something needs to give. All across Scotland, charges are being introduced and increased on the most vulnerable service users. These charges are not progressive. They fall on those with little choice but to find the money or to give up a service which, until now, they relied upon. They also fall on those without that choice, those who find the service that they relied upon simply closed to them or closed altogether. This, there is nothing progressive about this, presiding officer, and the fact that members here are both voting for these cuts and criticising them when their constituents complain is frankly more than inconsistent. The question for us today is what, we will, we, what will we do now? The First Minister has said that education is her number one priority. What good is education as a number one priority when we refuse to protect school budgets? when music education has to be cut, when there are fewer classroom assistants, when there are reduced library services, education delivered to our children by the same local councils bearing the brunt of austerity in Scotland because of decisions taken here in Scotland's Parliament. This is wrong, presiding officer. No exaggeration that it is wrong. I cannot understand why a party that argued for a penny for Scotland in a time of rising public expending cannot even admit that progressive taxation might have a role to play in the circumstances our communities now face. This is in direct contrast to the withdrawal of services and charging for services which is happening now. now I accept the government's argument that variability of bans in taxation is needed too, and my party actually remains committed to using that variability to further increase the progressivity of the tax system. But I also agree with John Swirry, who told the Finance Committee that he does regard the Scottish rate of income tax as a progressive lever. The question then is, is not, is not is the Scottish rate progressive, as some have tried to argue? It's not even, does John Swinney still agree with himself? It is, do we accept that there is no alternative to austerity? Do we believe that we have the right to complain about our deal and refuse to contemplate raising further revenue, whilst at the same time enforcing a worse deal on councils, who we also then prevent from raising their own revenue? Why is this government so timid? Where is the progressive politics that this country has been promised time and time and time again? Why is it that two parties who are opposed to austerity are going to vote differently on this budget tonight? Under successive budgets, presiding officer, we are not making our society fairer. We are simply making Scotland the best place to be born into privilege. And it is for that reason that I cannot uh, support that and I will not support this budget tonight. Thank you, Mr Smith. I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as in private budgets, today's uh, debate once again shows that the SNP is the only party committed to and capable of delivering a fair and balanced budget to provide the best outcomes for the people of Scotland. For example, a £444 million real terms increase in the NHS budget in the year from March. But with his resource departmental expenditure limit, to limit cut by to £371 million by Westminster, John Swinney has again had to ensure our public services can continue to operate effectively, uh, creating an environment which will stimulate growth, mitigating against the worst aspects of welfare reform at the same time. And of course, Tory government cuts uh, mean resource budgets will fall by £1.5 billion over the next four years, a reduction of 5.7 per cent. Labour's response to this year's £371 million cut is to demand an increase of income tax by a penny in the pound. Given that UK cuts over the next four years will be four times that, will our answer be to increase income tax by four pence in the pound over that period? 
Now, for weeks, Jackie Bailey called on Mr Swinney to set out his proposals for not one but four years. With an election in May, that always seemed to me somewhat bizarre. Either she expects the SNP to win, or if Labour wins, they want the SNP to decide the budget for the next four years. How curious. Of course, we have heard no long-term proposals from Labour itself. Indeed, short-term ones seem conspicuous by their absence. Uh, Labour talks of education, but the Deputy First Minister's announcement of a doubling of attainment uh, 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 expenditure was, going, was met by stony silence uh, and sour faces from the Labour benches. Of course, Labour's intellectual bankruptcy on the issue of a supposed rebate for low-paid workers following a post-tax rise can best be summed up by the exchange on the 11th of February in this chamber, when my colleague Stuart McMillan intervened on Lewis MacDonald and said, and I quote, I have listened carefully to what Lewis MacDonald has had to say. Can he tell Parliament exactly what the details of his party's proposed rebate would be? To which Mr MacDonald replied, I would be delighted to do that once we have heard from the SNP whether it supports the principle of raising tax to address austerity. So there you have it. Promise to vote for me and I'll tell you what I stand for. No wonder we in these benches don't take Labour seriously. Is this going to be Labour's canvassing technique in the next election? A Labour member chaps a door. Hi, I'm Lewis MacDonald. Will you be voting Labour? Tell me your policies, says the voter. Well, replies Mr MacDonald, I'd be delighted to do so if you promise to vote for me first. <laughs> Farcical or what? Is there any possibility, any possibility at all, that we will now be giving details of how Labour's rebate will be delivered? When will the scheme be in place? How much will it cost and who will pay for it? When can those to whom it applies expect to receive their £100? To whom should they apply and what happens if their income changes over the year? Mr Rowley. Alec Rowley. We know that there is going to be around £500 million cut to public services in Scotland. Are you saying that there is no alternative to that? Is that what you are saying? What I am saying is that this budget that the SNP has put forward is by far and away the most balanced approach to, to the £371 million cut imposed on the Tories. And we note that your criticism is always about this government, not about your former Better Together allies in the referendum campaign. And it's a real brass neck that Labour and the Lib Dems come to this chamber and publicly ask the people of Scotland to pay extra tax as a price for the austerity they were both happy to vote for and pass on to this Parliament. Because let's not forget, on the 13th of January last year, Labour MPs voted with the Tories to make public spending cuts of £30 billion, taking the UK back to spending cuts not since, since the 1930s. And I recall when Jackie Bailey was uh, election agent for uh, Wendy Alexander some years ago, backing Wendy when she called for year-on-year 3% -year cuts to local government funding, something the Scottish Government opposed. Now, on top of that, until they realised the way the wind was blowing, Labour were happy to side with the Tories in calling for the Scottish Government to accept the Treasury's fiscal framework agreement, which have then seen our budget cut by £7 billion. Held up to scrutiny, Labour tax plans have totally disintegrated and, apart from being unworkable, were low earners. The fact Labour had to be told their policy would hit half a million pensioners shows how well thought it out it was. And in evidence to the Finance Committee, the STC was clear that raising tax across the board, as Labour proposed, would be unfair on low earners. And I quote, the STC is concerned that the impact of a tax rise on low wage workers, particularly those in precarious employment, when wages which experienced a historically unprecedented collapse between 2009 and 2014 have barely started to recover. Maybe that is why, until the 1st of February, Labour backed the SNP government's position on tax until opportunistically calling for it to increase. Instead of punishing households in difficult economic times, the SNP government continues to lend a hand and reduces the burden placed on those trying to manage their own budgets with a fully funded freeze in council tax, saving Bandy, uh, pro uh, people in Bandy properties £1,500 at a time of high energy costs and real terms wage reductions. Presiding officer, in his opening speech, I thought Mr Fraser would have taken this opportunity to apologise on behalf of the Tory party for backing an initial block grant adjustment settlement proposed by the Treasury that would have cost Scotland £7 billion over a decade, impacting on jobs, services, taxation and growth. Clearly, the Tories will never stand up for Scotland, having been exposed as mere ciphers for the London government. How much would the impact on Scotland have had to be before the Tories in this chamber acted in Scotland's national interest? Ten billion? Fifteen billion? When the Tory stance on this issue sinks in, Ruth Davidson and Motley Crue will have no chance of supplanting even a bumbling and inept Labour as official opposition you in this parliament. You need to close, please, Mr Gibson. In the face of financial incompetence and absence of vision by the opposition, 
I support today's budget. Thank you, Mr Gibson. Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by uh, Michael Rutter. Heading up to context is all when it comes to tax uh, decisions, and the context today is an all-out assault on public services that we have the power to prevent. And that is why Labour has been absolutely focused throughout all the budget stages in February in saying that the priority for extra resources has to be local services in general and education in particular. And we've also been absolutely clear in identifying precisely where the money has to come from. And throughout the month of February, the response of the SNP has been astonishing, ever-changing, sometimes ridiculous, and most of all, completely out of proportion. I would sum it up by saying that the Scottish Government and the SNP in general has minimised the effect of the cuts on local government on the one hand, minimum impact on jobs and services is a phrase that will come to haunt John Swinney and the SNP in the next few uh, weeks and months, and on the other hand, maximising the consequences for low and uh, uh, below average earners. That, that's rather a euphemism, uh, uh, maximising, because really they have been wildly exaggerating and misrepresenting the effect, the effect of our tax uh, proposals. As Kezia Dugdale said, uh, quoting the Research Centre of the Parliament, 92% of the money uh, from the 1p tax rate increase will come from people above average incomes. Uh, and Kezia Dugdale also made this point, because of the raising of the tax threshold in April, nobody, this is disregarding the rebate scheme, which I know is the only thing that the SNP are obsessing about this afternoon, disregarding the rebate scheme for a moment, nobody under £19,000 uh, in April and May will pay a penny more than they are paying uh, this year. And of course the other thing, I'll, I'll give way in a minute, the other thing that the SNP have obsessed about throughout the month of February is the percentage uh, uh, in terms of the tax paid, the percentage increase, uh, whereas what really matters is how much extra money uh, people uh, are going to pay. John Swinney notoriously said that uh, the man or the person uh, or the man or woman uh, earning £200,000 would have a, a lower percentage tax increase than somebody on low pay. Of course, what he omitted to mention was that the person on £200,000 would pay 132 ty uh, times more in extra tax than the person on low pay. Once again, once again, disregarding the rebate. I give way to Chick Brody. Chick Brody. Anyway, I wonder if you, on, on the basis that uh, accepting uh, your, your line of 19,000, what is the impact of your tax proposal? What is the percentage change on the net disposable income of those, say, on £20,000 and those on £100,000? Malcolm Chisholm. To, to take £25,000, for example, someone would pay £5 a month extra. And that puts it in context when you think of the massive sums of extra money that would come from people on £100,000 and £200,000. So this sudden, uh, this sudden attack on income tax from a party that I think is still considering a local income tax and that proposed a penny increase uh, in, on, on income tax when, when, when public expenditure was increasing, this is an astonishing about turn. But turning to uh, where they are minimising the effect on local government, 5.2% cut again from the Research Centre. We recognise the £250 million extra for social care that Joan McAlpin and others spoke about, and of course that is, is a good uh, proposal, but of course it's, it's additionality for social care and the living wage, which we welcome, but it will not have any positive effect on other services, in particular the decimation of education. And I don't suppose John Swinney, because he was busy yesterday, had time to look at the evidence to the Education Committee. Uh, schools face major cuts to services in budget funding access. The newspaper headline I haven't got time to read it all, but Glasgow, East Ayrshire, they were all talking about the effect precisely on education. And of course, I welcome the extra money uh, in terms of the attainment gap. Or of course, it only goes to specific areas. And our policy in relation to the attainment gap is much better because it goes to all children, who, uh, uh, young people who need it. But uh, specifically, COSLA yesterday warned that the, the funding constraints would affect council's ability to tackle things like the attainment gap. So for some areas, today's announcement will help, uh, albeit it's over three years, but for many areas it will be no help whatsoever. 15,000 jobs 
COSLA said across Scotland. I know full well because 2,000 of those are in Edinburgh and I haven't got time to read for the third time in February the quote from the SNP uh, leader of Edinburgh Council uh, but uh, in summary he said that um, everyone will be hurt by these uh, proposals. So um, the SNP minimal impact scenario of course is in a glaring contradiction to what they generally say about these terrible cuts from London but the worst part of the budget in terms of these cuts is going to be minimal impact. This does not make any sense whatsoever. And it is not too late for them to change their mind. There has never been a better time for them to, uh, to, to change their policy uh, on tax. They're very riding high in the polls. The opinion polls are also saying that more people support our proposal than uh, oppose it. They have cover from two opposition uh, parties. Uh, and uh, um, most of all, of course, we have this uh, all-out assault uh, on uh, local government from the budget as proposed today. They may say, oh, well, next year we'll have more tax powers and we can change local government taxation, but local government in general, and education in particular, cannot wait another year. We must act now. We must act now to protect them for the sake of our children and the future of Scotland. Thank you, Mr Chisholm. I call Michael Russell to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to concentrate on two issues of particular importance to my constituents in Argyll and Butte, ferry services and local government services. When the Scottish Government was first elected in 2007, it was on a manifesto commitment to start delivering a policy which had been much talked about since the 1970s, road equivalent tariff. And after the Western Isles called Tyree pilot in the Government's first term, the 2011 SNP manifesto promised to roll out RET across the whole Hebridean and Clyde publicly funded ferry network, and that commitment has been honoured. Butte and Mull were the last two islands to be included, and they and the route across Loch Fyne experienced very substantial fare reductions in October last year. In addition, over the past nine years, a new ferry route has been opened up, a summer route from Ardrossan to Campbellton, and frequency increased on almost all services. New vessels have also been built. No, I want to make some progress. New vessels have also been built after almost a decade when virtually no investment was made in the fleet, an issue that has created legacy problems, such as those experienced by people on Island Colonsay last spring. Some of those vessels are also being built on the Clyde, which is a major step forward in procurement. And when necessary changes have had to be made, such as on the Danoon Gurukh route, work continues to try and improve what's on offer with an intention to go on doing so by providing passenger boats after the next tender. And I declare an interest. I'm a user of that service regularly. I use most ferry services in my constituency regularly. Ferries are the lifeline for many communities. So I'm also pleased that the Scottish Government is engaged in reviewing freight charges because they underpin that lifeline. They're crucial to the health and future of many communities. I hope a way can be found of ameliorating such charges. That would make an enormous difference. So would standardising vessels and shore infrastructure whose future proofing with regard to worsening weather is going to be a big priority for the coming years. By any measure, this government has delivered for the islands in my constituency, and the budget underlines the fact. For the deciding measure in the budget is figures, and they speak for themselves. In the last year of the Labour Liberal Executive, the ferry budget was £85 million. Just to keep pace with inflation, that now would be £111 million. However, in the coming year, it will actually be almost £199 million. A ferry budget up 132%. Yet in the last five years, the Scottish Government budget has actually gone down in real terms. Now, Argyll Butte has many challenges. Depopulation, poor digital infrastructure, distance, remoteness, a history of lack of central investment. The Council hasn't reformed to meet those challenges. It needs to change. That's the issue, as Audit Scotland itself has pointed out. It's those challenges that uh, led the Deputy First Minister to agree to meet with me and the Council Chief Executive and the Council Leader just two weeks ago to discuss how Argyll and Butte can be helped to change, given that it receives neither islands funding or the city deal, yet its depopulation problems are the worst in Scotland. And I hope those discussions will lead to new thinking, because that's what's needed. It's not just the Scottish Government saying that reform is vital if our local authorities are to deliver for their areas. My constituents are saying it, loud and clear, about their own local authority. The recent consultation on the budget invited responses from communities, and it got them. I wish I had time, presiding officer, to quote from more than two, but two will suffice. Here on the extreme west of the constituency, Tyree Community Council 
said to the Council that they must look at the way it conducts their business and provides essential services to the population in a much more thoughtful and innovative way, one in which the Council genuinely and proactively engages with communities. That was a view from Tyree. And on the east side of the constituency, from Glenorchy and Inishal, the Community Council observed of the, budget, the Council budget that the Council shows absolutely no imagination and severely affects the most vulnerable and isolated sections of the greater community of Argyll and Butte while protecting the core funding to middle and upper management. Now, not many of those ill-thought-out proposals were actually voted on, an indication of wolf being cried again by the Council Workforce, the Management and Administration. But several were, several were voted on. Oh, no! I know our Gallen Butte Council well. I know how they behave. Rabbits out of hats is what they specialise in. And the trouble is that people suffer in that process. Several, however, were voted through, including cutting every school librarian. That decision has provoked outrage across Argyll and further, but it was a decision of the council themselves, the council administration. The prize-winning author, children's author, Debbie Galori, pointed to the obscenity of having trident at one end of the constituency and no school librarians at the other. But there's a better way. No, I am not taking Mr Finlay until he learns to apologise properly in this chamber. There is a better way. I'm calling today on the council to take that better way to use the money that could be used by not replacing the Council Chief Executive, who's leaving to become Chief Executive of COSLA, using that £200,000 set aside for that task to make up the £191,000 that will be saved by cutting 10 part-time and full-time school librarians. Making that swap, presiding officer, would show that the administration is listening. It would put bairns and books before senior salaries and they would start the process of decentralisation, which is much needed. Presiding officer, our budgets in this place will always be constrained until Order we decide please, to closing. fend for ourselves. But when we need to, when we want to, when John Swinney, a financial wizard, wants to and needs to, he can work magic in making people reform, and that's the issue. This budget drives the process of reform. It's worth commending for that reason alone, but it also delivers for my constituents. Thank you, Mr Russell. I now call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Greens would have reasons, even before we consider questions of taxation, to be deeply concerned about the budget that's proposed. At a time when the world should be increasing its level of ambition on issues such as climate change, we see a dramatic reduction in effort in the current government, not least on the energy efficiency and fuel poverty agenda. And it's not enough simply to debate whether that's the result of a UK decision or a Scottish one. We need to reverse that decision by putting the investment in place. As well as that continued investment in unsustainable transport infrastructure, we would again be seeking to reverse these measures. But I would be willing to work constructively with any government, even despite those serious concerns, if they were willing to address the urgent challenges facing local services by raising the revenue that is necessary to protect them. Indeed, that's a case the Scottish Greens have been making since 2011, since the last Scottish Parliament election campaign, in which we argued that council tax as a diminishing share of local government revenue would be eclipsed by fees and charges, the least progressive way of funding those services. Well, that tipping point has been reached already. Council tax is no longer adequate to meet the, the needs of local councils. And for Mr Swinney to say that the responsibility for managing cuts is devolved to local level, but the decision about how much revenue should be raised will be held to the centre in the Scottish Government, I'm afraid that is simply not a position we can accept. I'm glad that there are other parties now agreeing with the basic principle that we must raise revenue in order to protect those services. We disagree about the means to achieve that goal. But I've exchanged views with Kezia Dugdale uh, in the, the, the reservations that we have about the Labour proposal. It is reasonable to ask questions about the practical implementation of a rebate. I, I'm glad that the communication I've had there has been constructive in tone, but I do regret, I do regret that Kezia Dugtail came to the Chamber today and suggested that the Labour proposal is the only alternative to administering the cuts at local government level, because we've shown very clearly that it isn't. 
We set out three clear opportunities the Scottish Government has for raising revenue in a locally accountable manner that directly would fund local services and also would reverse the squeeze or begin to reverse the squeeze that has been had from the centre about local economic flexibility. Some of these issues are already on the Scottish Government's agenda, but just not yet. The First Minister just recently, I believe, has been talking about using the council tax multiplier into the future as an alternative to scrapping the unfair and much loathed council tax. Well, if we can use that multiplier in the future, why not use it now? We've shown that by using the council tax multiplier, we can address the under-taxation of high-value properties while benefiting people who live in low-value properties. If it can be done in the future, why not now? The Scottish Government has also, in my view, wisely taken measures to address the rebate on, on non-domestic, the relief on non-domestic rates for uh, disused and vacant buildings. Even if the Scottish Government now seems to be rolling back a little from that position, it is still a positive move. But the perverse incentive which exists for the demolition of buildings in order to bring them uh, into the derelict land category, the vacant and derelict land category, will be increased. So let us bring that vacant and derelict land onto the valuation roll, make it all eligible to pay non-domestic rates. We've shown how that could raise in excess of £250 million a year, added to that the, the revenue that would come from changes to the council tax itself, and we would have a package of local finance measures which would raise roughly the same amount as the one pence Scottish rate of income tax proposal that we've heard. But it would do so without this continued stranglehold from the centre against local flexibility. Deputy Presiding Officer, Greens regret that the Scottish Government is not open either to discussions about a national or, in our preference, a local approach to raising revenue that will be necessary to protect public services. That's why we'll be voting against the budget today. But we will also continue to make that case into the longer term to ensure that local government in this country is worthy of the name and has the ability to make economic choices that are necessary in the context of cuts to public services. Thank you, Mr Harvey. I now call Chick Brodie to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, President Officer. May I firstly say I welcome the announcements made by the uh, Deputy First Minister regarding the attainment fund and also uh, his, the increased rates relief. This debate, President Officer, takes place against the backdrop of the agreement reached yesterday, the important agreement as any budget indeed is a building block, not just for now, but for future economic financial arrangements. The budget for 2016-17 set as it is uh, against the Westminster agenda has to balance the immediate impact of the austere cuts yet still secure and provide the route to economic growth. It does that. Uh, Presiding officer, my experience tells me that in tough financial conditions it is seductive to cut expenditure on areas that have a longer term impact on the uh, organisation's growth capability and to look only at the immediate cost base. In business, that tended to be areas of training and marketing. These were quick, short-term solutions with long-term disastrous consequences. This budget strides both the current short-term challenges, yet I believe Presiding Officer maintains a focus that will continue econ to build economic growth, a growth that will underpin the objective of creating a fairer and more prosperous nation. After the impact of the 2008 recession, our economy has grown in each and every quarter of the last three years, the longest period of uninterrupted growth since 2001. That is no coincidence, but a continuum of the economic strategy and the financial policies of this government in the safe hands of the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Extended by this budget will, I'm sure, be seen in the extension of that, this budget will be seen, I'm sure, in future budgets. Presiding officer, this budget offers a challenge to public bodies and to local authorities to seek to improve uh, productivity through agreeing to share services across the public sector and to do so working also with the private sector to overcome the austerity. It is a paramount, paramount that public sector activities and local authority activities and departments within the local authorities more assertively consider the sharing of services. Uh, provided through, for example, the consolidation 
of ICT delivery. It makes no sense now and or in the longer term to have three neighbouring councils as we have in Ayrshire uh, with running three different payroll systems, for example. There are many other examples uh, such as that. The use and outsourcing of activities that can be meaningfully outsourced to social enterprises in the third sector, just as happens in, in care services, can also produce the increased productivity that will help determine the public sector's major role in securing our future economic growth. Presiding officer, we can argue all day about the detailed level of each item of expenditure proposed, or in some cases, not detailed, as we just discussed in Labour's infamous penny on tax, with still no advice, still no advice on the overall implications of the proposed rebate. The details of COA are, of course, very important. I won't rehearse these, uh, as they have been much addressed by others today. Details which I believe the budget addresses, but as importantly, the question arises, does the budget continue to address longer-term macroeconomic issues? The issues of a sustainable economic and environmental future. The issues of investment, innovation, internationalisation and inclusion. Yes, it does. On investment in our digital infrastructure, £130 million to improve connectivity across communities, homes and businesses. Investment, protecting the small business scheme, delivering rates reductions for over 100,000 small businesses in Scotland. And of course, the uh, investment in the skills through the education uh, funding. On innovation, through the Funding Council, providing £120 million to eight innovation centres for world-class research in a whole series of technological sectors. On internationalisation, through new investment hubs in London, Brussels and Dublin and through a new trade and investment strategy. And above all, on inclusion and inclusive growth through working with employers, employees and trade unions together to deliver the business pledge and the Fair Work Convention to secure a high wage, high productivity economy that will create a leading, wealthy, healthy and green economy. Presiding officer, this budget does deliver these, these and as yesterday shows, we are in safe hands. Thank you, Mr Brody. James Kelly to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this debate this afternoon is one of the most important budget debates in the history of the Parliament because there is a choice on the table this afternoon. Uh, we can choose to support the, the Labour proposal of uh, Labour tax proposals which will support investment in public services or we can go down the route proposed by the SNP budget which will result in £500 million of public service cuts. And I welcome the debate this afternoon because I think it's the chance to have an honest debate about the choices in front of us. It's just unfortunate that the SNP MSPs have not been able to engage with that all through the debate. Uh, no, I won't give way. All through the debate, they, the, all through the debate, they have chuckled, uh, chuckled away. They have indulged in the pretence that this budget is fine and it's not going to result in five hundred million pounds of cuts. And there was no greater example of that than from John Swinney himself when he said that the claim that there are going to be thousands of council job losses was greatly exaggerated. That was patronising to those that are going to face the prospect of a P45 uh, in the months ahead. I only need to look at my constituency to see the examples of cuts that are, that are going to have options that are going to be, have to be faced up to by the local council because of the allocation passed down from this government. The Healthy and Happy Project, which promotes good health initiatives in Rutherglen, something that government ministers have been delighted to, to visit and to praise, faces the prospect of losing all its council funding. Burnhill Sports Centre, only a stone's throw away from some of the Commonwealth Games venues, and we all agreed on how the importance of the Commonwealth Games legacy, that faces the prospect of, of, of closure. 
and those uh, who want to use the other facilities face the prospect of leisure cuts going up, uh, leisure costs going up by 20 per cent. Quite frankly, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, my constituents deserve better. There is another way, uh, and that is the, the labour option. That con consistently, uh, during budget uh, debates, the SNP challenged Labour to bring forward an alternative proposal and to explain how we would fund uh, the different options on the table. We have done that in this case. And it is a fair option. It would, it would actually help the lowest paid and it would offset many of the cuts that people have spoken about this afternoon. No, I won't give way. The SNP simply have indulged here in cut and paste austerity, taking the Osborne allocation and reallocating it throughout Scotland. And it is uh, sheer hypocrisy. Because if you look at what happened at last year's election. Nicola Sturgeon appeared in many of the election leaflets for the, for the election candidates and told the, the, the Scottish public that a vote for the SNP would put public services before austerity. But the reality of the budget that we're facing here tonight is that austerity has been delivered and public services uh, are being slashed. Uh, Mr. Mark McDonald. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. He will, of course, recognise that at that election we were proposing a 0.5% increase in public spending at Westminster, which would have brought an end to austerity. However, we did not get the result in that election that we hoped for, and we now have a Conservative government continuing to perpetuate austerity. That is the reality that this Scottish budget faces. James so Mr. Kelly. Kelly should acknowledge James that. Kelly. So, so in this budget, Mr. Macdonald. What you propose is a £500 million cut to council budgets. <laughs> Deputy, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Presiding Officer refused to accept the Labour amendment for this budget debate. But in actual fact, I would like to propose an amendment for the SNP leaflet that can be used uh, in the future election campaign. A vote for the SNP in this election campaign is a vote for thousands of jobs to be lost throughout Scotland. A vote for the SNP is a vote for hundreds of millions of pounds of council cuts. And a vote for the SNP is a vote for vital services to be slashed. And summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, this debate is about choices. And if we really are serious as MSPs in this Parliament, we should be looking to make the choice that makes a difference. We should be looking to support investment in schools, to protect council jobs and to defend local services. And if we want to make those choices and promote those choices, then we shouldn't support the budget at five o'clock tonight. Thank you. Before we move on, can I say there have been a few instances this afternoon of members failing to speak through the chair. I know it's only a few weeks to dissolution, but I would like standards to be maintained. And if members could please speak through the chair. John Mason to be followed by George Adam. Hey, thank you, uh, presiding officer. And once again, we find ourselves debating the Scottish budget, uh, but I think somewhat later than usual this year. And as I understand it, the main reason for this is Westminster's continuing to go its own merry way with little or no respect for the impact on the devolved administrations, and so they had their autumn statement when it suited them, it thus delaying our budget process. Now, we have seen this lack of respect again in the discussions around the fiscal framework, as they have tried to cut the Scottish budget along the way, and it has required the Cabinet Secretary to valiantly fight them off. But I guess I find it disappointing and a bit depressing that at the start of what is meant to be a new era in the relationship between Scotland and the UK, there is still this fairly open desire at Westminster to do Scotland down, if at all possible. Now, it has not been surprising that uh, a rise in the Scottish rate of income tax has featured again today, although I think the decision on, on that was made last week. This has been Labour's big idea, and to be fair, it is good to see them having ideas once again. For repeated budgets, Labour has asked for more spending in multiple areas, but would not say how they were funding it. And this year, they're proposing a partial funding eh, with SRIT, but as usual, the spending desires outweigh the cash available. 
Now, the key factor in this budget, as long as Westminster controls the vast bulk of our powers, is that if Westminster cuts the Scottish budget, any Scottish government of any political colour has to reflect this by cutting its budget too. It is just not realistic to say that we can ignore Westminster austerity. And it's worth remembering why Westminster austerity has come about. Labour and Tory governments at Westminster failed to create an oil fund for a rainy day. In fact, according to Gordon Brown, there would be no more rainy days because he had abolished boom and bust. And of course, it was Westminster that failed to regulate the financial sector and the banks sufficiently. So austerity is not some random thing that fell out the sky. Austerity was caused by Westminster mismanagement and a bit more humility from the Westminster parties might be appreciated. So we have to live... Eh, absolutely, yes. Mary Scanlon. I do appreciate you giving way, Mr Mason. Uh, talking about mismanagement, we've heard so much today about cuts in spending. What about the NHS 24 IT budget overspent by £50 million and the cap payments overspent by over £70 million. Do you not think your own government is wasting and mismanaging thousands of millions of pounds in Scotland? Before I call John Mason, can I just remind the Chamber to speak through the Chair, please? John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as the Member uh, says, IT, I think, has been a challenge, and I think Westminster has found IT a challenge as well. But I think we should remember the control that has been kept over major capital expenditure by this Government. For example, my favourite, the Airdrie Bathgate uh, rail line, the M74 extension, the Borders rail line, and I think there are quite large savings on the fourth replacement crossing. Uh, so a pretty good record, uh, if you ask me. So we have to live with the results of Westminster mismanagement and SNP governments have done a, their best and done very well to protect ordinary people, including, for example, mitigating against the bedroom tax and other welfare cuts, protecting health expenditure and freezing the council tax. Now on that last one, let's remember that council tax is a regressive tax, taking no account of ability to pay. So raising the council tax would hit poorer, poorer folk relatively harder and I am convinced it is right to freeze it once again. However, longer term, the only answer is to replace the council tax, and I, for one, would certainly support local government having more autonomy going forward. But I would like to see, I would like to see some over-centralised councils like Glasgow giving, if you don't mind, a, giving more autonomy to wards or sectors of the city. It cannot be all about transfer of powers from Westminster to Holyrood, from Holyrood to local authorities. There also has to be devolution in cities like Glasgow to actual communities. Having said that the council tax freeze should be supported, we also do need to consider other tax raising options. And the one that we have spent a lot of time on in the Finance Committee and obviously here again today has been the Scottish rate of income tax. Now let's remember this power was given to us by the Scotland Act 2012. And when it was going through, I was in the Scotland Bill Committee here. We had discussions with Conservative and Lib Dem ministers from Westminster as to whether they would give us wider powers on income tax, which would let us be more progressive and redistribute income and so on. And I think both Labour and SNP members wanted that. But Westminster ministers point blank refused and said that anything to do with redistribution had to be reserved to them. So now we have the power and we have studied it at length and lo and behold, it is not very progressive. Well, that's a shock. I do not think I'm the only SNP backbencher who is very much open to a more progressive income tax system. But sadly, for 2016-17, this is not an option which is on the table. Raising SRIT by a penny or two pence might seem attractive in offering more funding, but I certainly consider that any advantage from that would be outweighed by the increased tax burden on ordinary people. Now, up until yesterday, we weren't even sure what powers we would have in 1718. But I would suggest we will have the opportunity, if we wait one more year, to be able to do something which is much more targeted, much more progressive, and much more helpful to ordinary people. Presiding officer, these are not easy times. The easier times were when Margaret Thatcher and Gordon Brown squandered the oil money and spent profligately. But we are where we are. This is a time to do all we can to protect ordinary people. It is not a time to raise tax for ordinary people. You must I close. support the budget. Thank you. I call George Adam to be followed by Jean Arkert. Thank you, President Officer. Once again, I'm pleased to be part of this budget debate. And I have a number of points that I want to contribute. 
I think we must remain focused on what the Scottish Government has and continues to deliver. And first and foremost, I want to talk about the £33 million of investment in attainment for this year, including support for the Scottish Attainment Challenge, to close the gap between our most and least deprived areas. Can I also welcome the Deputy First Minister's announcement from earlier on today as well. It's been gratifying as a member of the Education Committee that during our debate on attainment, uh, the subject has been something that many of us have agreed on, regardless of political party, because for far too long, we've allowed where you live to be a potential negative factor on your educational outcomes. And that brought us to uh, yesterday in the Education Committee, where we had uh, representatives from COSLA, council representatives and councillors themselves and officers as well. And uh, they were uh, there to talk about the budget and the challenges ahead. And there was much talk, presiding officer, of the challenges and the difficulties. But very positive question about how do we actually find the solutions, how do we find the way forward. They were extremely positive and they came up with all the great ideas that are working throughout Scotland at our local authority levels. And my argument, and I believe the, the point that the Deputy First Minister keeps trying to put forward as well, is we need to look at these ideas and this innovation and share them more widely to ensure that we can really deliver for the young people in Scotland. And it was interesting to hear when Ian Robertson, the Assistant Director for Education in Glasgow, he admitted that, and I'm paraphrasing what he said here, but most of the authorities aren't good at sharing the great programmes they kind of keep it to themselves because they don't want to share it. Now, that might be part of the problem we're dealing with here as we look at ways of delivering education throughout Scotland. Because we have, I remember as my time in local authority that we kept getting told the panacea was shared services and working together. But we've got a situation here where a senior officer in one of Scotland's largest councils admits at a committee here that councils aren't good at sharing anything. Now, if we've got good practice and we have the ability to do this, and they were so passionate during that five-minute uh, discussion, then surely they should be doing everything they possibly can to share that. But, you know, all that investment and attainment alone is not enough. We have to ensure that pupils are learning within a positive environment. And that's why I welcome the Scottish Government has continued its substantial investment in school buildings throughout through the Scotland Schools for the Future programme. So we have investment in closing the attainment gap. We have new and refurbished schools. And the Scottish Government has invested £88 million funding package to maintain teacher numbers, ensuring teaching induction places and secured for all probationers requiring one. So we have all that in place at local government level and investment from the Scottish Government. So we have the teachers, we have the buildings, and we have the vision and commitment on attainment. But as the Deputy First Minister stated, the Scottish Government are still committed to free school meals for all primary ones to three pupils. And again, I want to talk about how we are still delivering during these difficult times. The continued investment of £1 billion in our highly successful higher education sector, while ensuring the con uh, con uh, continuation of free education in Scotland, there's a continued investment of, of 600 hours of free, high-quality early learning and childcare offered to all three- and four-year-olds and vulnerable two-year-olds, moving to 1,140 hours by the end of the next Parliament. This is helping and supporting families throughout our country, ensuring that they are getting the support they need. So it is not as bleak and as dark as the opposition parties make out. So from early years to higher education, the Scottish Government is investing on and a continued drive in closing the educational attainment gap. This is a Scottish Government who is supporting Scotland's families, working towards creating a more positive outcome and a future, better future for them all. All of this work ongoing during devastating Westminster spending cuts. As I said during the Stage 1 debate, even during these ongoing attacks in Westminster, the Scottish Government still maintains within this year's budget free higher education, maintaining funding for free prescriptions and eye checks, free concessionary travel for older, disabled and young people, and free personal nursing care is maintained as a vital part of the reformed community-based health and social care services. So this shows you a government that even in these difficult times, has still managed to maintain and deliver more for the future. 
The Scottish Government budget has been slashed by Westminster, but it has been the SNP Government who have set out a clear alternative to the Tory austerity agenda. It is the Scottish Government that is proving that even in these difficult times, they can find a better, more positive way forward for our nation. President officer, I believe uh, uh, that our vision, purpose, the Deputy uh, First Minister has put forward for the budget. Who would you trust to stand up for Scotland's people during these difficult times? A proven Scottish Government that continues to deliver, or the opposition parties who currently are arguing over who is going to get second place in the Scottish elections? Unlike them, I have the ambition for Scotland, and unlike them, I believe that the com our communities that we represent also have that ambition for the future and are supporting the Scottish Government and John Swinney and his budget. Thank you. I now call Jean Urquhart. Ms Urquhart, I can give you up to four minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, as we discuss and debate today's Scottish budget, it's important that we set the political and economic framework at the UK level to provide the backdrop and the context to these deliberations. The UK economy is weak and unbalanced. It is tied inextricably to the Tory economic plan, austerity, privatisation and the concentration of economic activity into the financial services industry. Growth is predicated on increasing personal debt. The very problems that compounded the economic crisis of 2008 have not been removed, they have been entrenched. Steve Barwick of the respected New Policy Institute concluded in a report in early, early this year that another recession is inevitable. He said, if the UK economy can be likened to a four-cylinder car, then actually not one of its four cylinders is firing as smoothly as it should. Productivity is in the doldrums. Unemployment is artificially high due to self-employment. Household income growth has, not be, has been non-existent. Trade deficits are frighteningly high. Look beneath the bonnet and we find the UK economy both weak and unbalanced. 2016 has seen George Osborne preempt the next crisis by talking up what he refers to as the cocktail of threats to the UK economy. None of them to do with him, of course. The context of this Scottish budget is the failure, political and economic, of Westminster and the city. It underlines the need for us to pursue independence and a different path away from austerity and casino finance. The Smith Commission, frankly, is not going to alter that. At the same time, there are things we can do without the full powers we need to transform the economy, and we must agitate against austerity. And the Labour Party penny increase in tax, I don't have any issue with that, but I wish that they would see that to, to ask for the full powers in order that we don't have to make some complicated rebate system, then we could have that. But you have to join the independence debate for that. Thus, there is both the need for us to have a long-term strategy and a short-term approach to immediate economic policy. And with that in mind, I would, I would like to raise two immediate areas for the budget. Firstly, it is good to see the high levels of investment into the health service. This place holds the NHS being central to developing a decent society for all. It is an institution we must defend. However, analysis, analysis carried out by the Royal College of General Practitioners shows that under the current plans, the proportion of the budget devoted directly to general practice in Scotland will fall. And in my area, investment in hospitals and so on, but in a, a scattered remote and rural area, the general practice is so important. So the decline in their budget, I think, is, is, uh, is wrong, uh, while I approve the general increase in the NHS. Another area where investment is needed now more than ever is the sectors which mitigate against the effect of catastrophic, catastrophic climate change. The WWF Scotland's director, Langbank, said these new figures undermine the Scottish Government's claim to have embedded climate change in its draft budget with the Paris Conference having demonstrated increased international commitment to tackling climate change, we should be stepping up our action and not pulling back. Scotland can and should lead the way on investment into tackling change, and I recognise that we need more powers to do more, but I want to raise this to put it at the centre of agenda going forward. Austerity is the central dynamic around which this budget is built. Austerity politically imposed by Westminster, but we have a choice. We have to not only be creative when it comes to managing... You need to bring budget, your remarks to a close. We need to politically oppose the Tories' root and branch, and that means supporting anti-cuts movements. It means making sure that the SNP MSPs are agitational at Westminster 
and it means that we in Scotland need to look towards creating needs budgets. And of course, it means we must continue to campaign for independence. Thank you. We now move to the wind-up speeches. Can I call on Gavin Brown, Mr Brown, six minutes? Presenting officer, uh, thank you very much. I guess there were no huge uh, surprises in today's budget debate. There were two new measures uh, from what I could uh, gather, both of which on this side of the chamber we welcome. The increase in the attainment fund and the extension of the empty rates uh, industrial period from three months to six months. It doesn't go far enough, presiding officer, but we welcome uh, the change from three to six. I think it is a pity, though, that uh, this year the Scottish Government have been unable to convince a single other political party in this chamber to support their budget. I know they have a majority. I know they have a majority, presiding officer, but I do think, I do think for the sake of our politics, it is a pity. It's impossible to get everyone on board, and it's not easy to get everyone on board, especially when they're coming from different places. But I think it is a matter of regret that the Scottish Government didn't make it a priority to attempt to get at least one other political party to support what they want to do. And I hope in future, a future Scottish Government will take a slightly different approach. We have seen, I think, some of the best examples of double standards from the SNP today that I've seen in quite some time. Because speaker after speaker on the SNP benches today said that the £371 million real terms cut to the Scottish budget was slashing the budget, deeply flawed, disgraceful, devastating, and a whole load of other invective all the way through. That real terms cut, of course, is a cash terms increase. So the overall Scottish budget goes up in cash terms, down in real terms by 371 million. But in the same breath, speakers didn't seem to note any irony at all in suggesting that a 500 million pound cash terms cut to local authorities would make any impact. They claimed there would be minimal impact and almost no job losses whatsoever with a £500 million cash terms cut, yet a, real, yet a cash terms increase to their budget as a whole uh, was deeply flawed, devastating and disgraceful. And it's interesting to see that in the same speeches, in the same speeches, they were able to uh, not get that point. I have to give way to Mr Crawford. Bruce Crawford. I, wonder, I wonder if Gavin Brown would agree with the Conservative finance convener of Stirling Council, who said the council is not in a bad financial state. We are able to move forward, and in this budget there are some items of growth and good capital allocations. Ah. Is that not the reality facing Stirling Council? Present, presenting officer, Brown. If, if that is correct, presenting officer, then I simply say to Bruce Crawford, on what basis does he and all of his colleagues say that a cash terms increase to the Scottish Government as a whole is devastating and the wrong way to go. It's as simple as that, yeah. presiding officer. But we will not be supporting this budget today, and Murdo Fraser outlined why we don't think this government genuinely prioritises the economy. Their big ideas in the last couple of years have been the <laughs> business pledge, which has low investment and low take-up, and the Scottish Business Development Bank, which three years since it was first announced still is nowhere near happening, and we have no idea whether, in fact, it will actually happen. We have had hits to colleges, as we heard about. Tens of thousands of people in this country no longer have access to the part-time courses in colleges. Now, that is unfair, <laughs> because people who have challenges, people who are often vulnerable, relied upon part-term courses in order to get back into the labour market. And it is no point just talking about full-term places. Part-term places are very important too. We see cuts to the help to buy budget, presiding officer, despite the fact that minister after minister appeared on press releases with their hard hats looking at people uh, getting their new houses. And I think we have become less competitive on tax. At one point, when this government took over as a majority, we probably were more competitive than the rest of the UK. But with successive budgets, they've done their level best to erode that. We've got LBTT residential rates that are stunningly high. We've got a slightly higher rate for commercial for LBTT, and we hear about the doubling of the large business supplement, which businesses had no idea that was coming. There was no manifesto commitment towards that. And some of the oil and gas businesses, who the Scottish Government are determined to help, will be hit hardest by this particular measure. And so, for all of those reasons, we don't think there is a budget that helps the economy. But let me close on a, on a, 
uh, more positive note towards the government presenting officer because we do, as Murdo Fraser said, support their income tax proposal. But we voted on that just before recess, so we're not actually voting specifically on that today. I think it's good that the Scottish Government held firm under political pressure because I genuinely thought they would fold. They have quite often folded in the past when the gentlest of political pressure has been applied. So I pay tribute to them for deciding not to increase income tax and to keep it at the same rate as the rest of the UK because it is quite right that people in Scotland should not pay a higher income tax than people in the rest of the UK. And we stand shoulder to shoulder with the Scottish Government on this against the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats, presiding officer. Murdo Fraser, weeks ago, described this as the new better together. Now, that was said, said slightly tongue-in-cheek, I think, presiding officer, but actually, not only were we better together then, We've acted together over the last couple of the weeks as two different parties. And I noted that now they're using the language of better together. We used to say no thanks for better together, presenting officer. A Scottish National Party leaflet coming out just recently, <laughs> again, is stealing the language of better together with no thanks. So on that, I'm happy to close, presenting officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Brown. I now call on Jackie Bailey. Ms Bailey, eight minutes. Oh, that, that was just fantastic, presiding officer. You know, despite, despite, the, despite the heat and noise of today's debate, you know, one thing is clear. We have a choice today, a choice between cutting hundreds of millions of pounds from essential services and investing in the future of our economy and our country. And we've been treated today to pantomime applause. We've even been treated to John Swinney being described as a wizard. Well... A slightly older version of Harry Potter, maybe. But we've also been treated to single transferable insults around the chamber, treated to speakers being shouted down by government ministers and backbenchers, and frankly, it has been an unedifying sight. But you know, the louder they shout, the more we know they are losing the argument, presiding officer. <laughs> louder, louder. Nicola Sturgeon's body language said it all in the stage one debate. She may turn her back on me, presiding officer, but she must not turn her back on the opportunity to stop the cuts to jobs and services in Scotland today. Because if she does that, if she does that, she will be guilty of the most utter hypocrisy, saying one thing in public and the complete opposite in private. Do you know, I remember Nicola Sturgeon telling us that more powers meant fewer cuts. I remember Nicola Sturgeon traipsing down to London to tell an incoming UK government how they could end austerity. Yet now, in this Scottish Parliament, she has the opportunity to practice what she preaches. So why is the SNP now so silent? Why do they prefer copying George Osborne instead of protecting the people of Scotland? And I regret that what we are witnessing is SNP rhetoric triumphing over positive action. They want more powers, presiding officer, but they're not going to use them. Passing on more than even George Osborne's cuts to the Scottish Government on to local government. But do you know, Mark Macdonald, in probably his most interven interesting intervention today, gave it away. It's okay for the SNP to tell Westminster to be anti-austerity, but when given the choice to be anti-austerity in this parliament, the SNP turned their back on it. <laughs> and believe me, the cuts to come are even worse. I take no comfort from that, but no wonder John Swinney didn't want to publish a budget for years two and three. He wants to keep you quite deliberately in the dark. These will be John Swinney's hidden cuts, the cuts that are still to come. And I want to see, as I'm sure most in the chamber do, a growing economy. I want to see young people do better than the generation that went before them, better skilled for the jobs of tomorrow in the industries of the future. But you don't get that without investing in your people. You don't get that without ensuring that jobs and the economy are at the heart of it. And the SNP's record in terms of education and skills is woeful. We now have 4,000 fewer teachers, 150,000 fewer students in our colleges, class, sizing, class sizes increasing and more to come. 
So I would invite John Swinney to take off his rose-tinted spectacles because that's the story he's not telling you. Spice tell us that investment in education will result in an increase in economic activity and GDP in the order of £2 billion. That means jobs for people in my community. That means jobs for people across Scotland. It means a growing economy. What's not to like about that? Tonight, the SNP will set their face against that and will vote for cuts. Income tax is, by its very nature, a progressive tax. Experts have told us that, including Stirling University, the Resolution Foundation, IPPR, and even John Swilly, Swinney acknowledges this. In his own words, clearly people on higher incomes will pay comparatively more than people on lower incomes. As Kezia Dugdale pointed out, for every pound, 92 pence would come from the top half of earners, two-thirds from the very top 20% of earners. Now, I know that Mr Swinney likes to talk about percentages, but let me talk about cash, because people talk about the money in their pocket, not the percentage of income that's that. No, I think we've heard enough from Mark Macdonald today. On radio, on radio, there you go. On radio, John Swinney said, for an individual who's on the national living wage, earning £13,000, the amount of tax they would pay would increase by 5%. But somebody earning £200,000, their increase would be 2.6%. What he doesn't tell you are the cash figures, presiding officer. Because in the case of somebody earning £13,000, that would be £19, equivalent to 36 pence a week. Somebody, alternatively, on John Swinney's salary would be paying 48 pounds a week. That's 132 times more than the low-income taxpayer would pay. Now, I have to say, for anybody on, for anybody on a six-figure salary to tell low-paid workers that he's protecting their incomes when he's really protecting people like himself is simply wrong. <laughs> Presiding officer, Presiding officer, I am very Order. clear that in this parliament, if you want to do something, you can. It takes political will, it takes cooperation across the parties. It's something absent from the SNP when it comes to talking about low paid workers. We would provide a payment of £100 through local authorities made up front to everyone paying tax and earning less than £20,000. Help for people, Order. help for people Order. earning the least which the SNP would deny them. And I remind John Swinney about the bedroom tax. It took a year because he wanted to keep people hanging on the hook. Well, presiding officer, we care about low paid people. We intend to put measures in place that will actually improve life for them, unlike the SNP. But you know, at the end of the day, presiding officer, Politics is all about choices. This is the last opportunity for the SNP to make the right choice. If this budget is passed tonight, then these will be Swinney's cuts. There will be no one to blame but the SNP. It will be down to each and every SNP MSP to defend. What you're voting for tonight is the SNP's choice, their choice to cut hundreds of millions of pounds from the services we all rely on. Their choice to cut thousands of jobs. And can I say, John Swinney is entirely wrong to minimise the impact of job losses. 40,000 jobs have already gone from local government under the SNP. Thousands more to go as a result of his budget. 350 in SNP-controlled Clackmannanshire. One small SNP council. 350 jobs to be cut. Is Mr Swinney going to tell each and every one of them that they are utterly exaggerating? No, I don't think so. The SNP choice tonight is short-sighted. What we need is bold and radical action to invest in skills, to grow our economy and to secure the future of the nation. Their choice is to pass on Tory austerity to Scotland and if you were ever in any doubt about that, just look at the evidence. The SNP applauded by the Tories. The SNP praised by the Tories in their new Taxpayers' Alliance. And indeed, the Deputy First Minister happy, 
Deputy First Minister happy to sit down with the Tories but won't meet the workers outside this Parliament who are about to lose their jobs. <laughs> Presiding officer, faced with the choice of continuing Tory austerity or using the powers we have to invest in the future of our country, we choose to use our powers. I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate, Deputy First Minister, until five o'clock. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, let me begin first of all with the comments that Gavin Brown made about the fact that no other party was on board to support the government's budget tonight. And obviously that's, um, uh, that's uh, regrettable that no other party has seen fit to support the government in delivering the largest cash settlement that has ever been delivered in the history of Scotland to the health service. I would have thought that might have attracted some support from somebody within the chamber or perhaps for the Conservatives to think about the possibility of supporting the continuation of the small business bonus scheme, but they're all going to vote against that when it comes to five o'clock and the, the Labour Party. Well, well, let me get into my stride, Dr Simpson. We'll, we'll have a wee go later on. Um, and, um, the, and the Labour Party voting against modern apprenticeships, but of course the Labour Party's got a habit of voting against modern apprenticeships because they've voted against those provisions despite asking for them in budgets that I previously put to Parliament on earlier occasions. Now Mr Brown also said that um, he was pleased that the government had not folded on the issue of the Scottish rate of income tax. And I think that was a comment that really, you know, Mr Brown's a, a, a seasoned contributor towards in parliamentary debates. He should have known that was a comment that really lacked, he, he says substantial things to Parliament, but that's a comment that Mr Brown should have known lacked substance. After yesterday, it's very obvious this government doesn't fold even to Her Majesty's <laughs> Treasury. <laughs> Not once. Seven billion pounds, Order. three and a half billion pounds, absolutely nothing. We don't fold to the Treasury on this side of the Parliament. And I have to say, Mr Rennie's a dispassionate contribution to the debate, lecturing us about the importance of investing in public services in Scotland after the collaboration between the Tories and the Liberal Democrats for five years that wrecked public finances in this country. What a cheat Mr Rennie's got coming to Parliament saying that. Will it, Rennie? If he really feels strongly about it, now that he's got the powers, why isn't he doing something about it? Deputy First Minister. Well, I'll, 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 I'll come on to the explanation about that in a moment when I, I deal with the issues around tax. But really, Mr Rennie should think about how seriously he's taken in the country when he complains about austerity when he was the harbinger of austerity on behalf of the Conservative Party. <laughs> Just beyond the truth. Now, there's been a lot of discussion in the debate. Uh, are we... Oh, oh. I, oh, I, I thought we were getting a wee intervention there from Mr Scott, but it was, it was just business as usual from Mr Scott. <laughs> um, the, a lot of talk the, today about the... Oh, oh we're still... Oh, we're, uh, I, was, I, was, I was almost about to give way there, actually. Um, we then go on to the, the local government settlement, and uh, the, a lot of numbers have been banded around in Parliament today. And uh, there is uh, a cash reduction in the local government budget of £500 million. And I've gone through this before with Parliament... £150 million of that reduction is in capital expenditure, which will be put into the local government settlement with more assurance for a longer-term capital programme that I've given to local authorities than they had before the settlement was put in place. That leaves a resource reduction of £350 million. And anyone looking at the correspondence that I've exchanged with local authority leaders will see that that £350 million is tempered by the investment of £250 million in the integration of health and social care, which is a vital service in which local authorities are partners. And it is exactly the, same, the type of investment that the Labour Party called upon us to make, and we did that. So here we have the good old situation where the Labour Party calls for something, I deliver it, 
and they vote against it. It's just business as usual. And I, I, of course, I'll take intervention. Okay, McIntosh. Thank you, President. So Mr. Swinney has asked us to look at the correspondence with local authorities. Can he cite one local authority leader who agrees with him on this matter? First, but the first well, they're all minister. signed up, so. Uh, oh, oh, oh. They're, they're, they're 32, to be honest. I've got, I've, got, I've got 32 letters saying yes from the local authority leader of Scotland, and I'm very grateful to them. Because what they recognise is that with all the gloom and doom from the Labour Party, we've put £250 million into health and social care to meet the needs of the people of our country. That's what this government has done. Uh, yes, I'll give way to Mr Rowley. Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I mean, the Deputy First Minister has been dishonest because the fact is, the fact is, he knows, the fact is he knows that Labour councils, indeed council leaders across Scotland, had no choice. And most of them that wrote back to him, most of them that wrote back to him, pointed that out. But can I also point out, in, the, in terms of the health and social care, the additional monies that were going in had to go in because those services were absolutely falling apart and in crisis. And that doesn't solve the £500 million of cuts. Mr Rowley, Mr Rowley, I'm sure you didn't mean to use the word dishonest. Could you withdraw it? Order. Disingenuous, you know, the same meaning. Deputy First Minister. Oh, well, let's, let, let's, let, let's, uh, let's just go on with finishing this off then. Um, on the question then of tax, let's get on to tax. Because um, you, the, 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 the argument has been put forward that, the, uh, um, that somehow uh, the tax change proposed by the Labour Party would have no effect on people in low-income households. That's the pretense that the Labour Party is trying to put forward. And one of the points that they took exception to what I said in the Stage 1 debate was I said that they were casually disregarding the financial impact, the cash impact of this, on individuals on low incomes. And John Mason has tenaciously pursued this point during the budget debates, and I completely agree with Mr Mason on this point. This is where the Labour Party has lost touch with its roots. Because Jackie Bailey, in her comments just a second ago, just said that it didn't really matter if you increase somebody's income at a, if they're earning £13,000, because it's only £19. Do the Labour Party not realise how important sums of money like that are to people in low incomes? That's how they've lost touch with their roots. And, and uh, of course... Contrast. It's £19 a year or no classroom assistance, no English and maths teachers, libraries shut, community centres closed, the very fabric of our society affected the most vulnerable and most disadvantaged. That's the choice he's made today and that's the one he'll regret. Deputy First Minister. And the choice that Kezia Dugdale has opted for is to get the poor to pay for the Tories' austerity and I'm having none of it. Ken, Ken McIntosh said that we had resorted to weasel words about the rebate. Weasel words would be an exaggeration of the detail that we've had about how this rebate can somehow be paid to people on low incomes in our, in our country. There is absolutely nothing of credibility about this, uh, this programme. Now, Drew Smith said in his, in his remarks that it was, he couldn't understand why two progressive parties were going to be voting differently at five o'clock tonight. Well, the Labour Party and the SNP are parties that believe in progressive agendas and have done for many, many years. But in 2008-2009, the Labour Party courageously abstained on my budget, didn't vote with us. In 2019, 2010, they vote against. The bill fell, and then on the emergency bill, which after they made a total horlicks of the budget, they came and voted for the budget. In 2010, 11, 12, they voted against the budget. They only voted for it in 2013 when I was able to put in place a workable solution to the bedroom tax problem when they had been unable to come up with a solution to the bedroom tax. And in 2000. And in 2014-15, they voted against. So Mr. Mr Smith should not be at all surprised 
that the uh, SNP and the Labour Party vote in different ways on budget days because all the Labour Party is interested is in pursuing the, 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 the narrow lines of grievance in a budget process when this government is determined to invest in the priorities of the people. Of course. Chris Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm grateful to the Deputy First Minister. He was asked a question during the debate. We know we've had tens of thousands of workers in local government have already left. COSLA put their estimate at 15,000 would leave as a result of this budget. Does he have an estimate, and will he share that figure with Parliament? Deputy First Minister. What, 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 I'll say to, what I'll say to the Chamber today is I believe the estimates that have been made by local government are exaggerated and they've been inflated by the Labour Party into the bargain. Now, when it comes to voting at five o'clock, the people of this country, the, people, the members of Parliament have a choice. It's a choice about whether we take decisions this afternoon to invest in public services or whether we posture in this debate. And OK, the reason why nobody else, the reason why nobody else has voted for the budget is because we've got an election coming up in a few weeks' time and people will have their choice. But at five o'clock, it will not be the SNP voting the same way as the Tories, as the Labour Party would love to create. It will be the Labour Party and the Conservatives back together again, voting together against this budget which invests in the public services of our country. This is a budget to secure the future of the people of Scotland, to protect people in low-income households and to make sure that we invest for the future of our country. That, that concludes the debate on the Budget Scotland No. 5 Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 15714. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15714. Formally moved. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 15714, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of nine Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 15715 to 15722 on approval of SSI's on block. Moved on block. And motion number 15723 on the designation of a lead committee. The questions on these the motions will be put at this time to which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 15693, in the name of Don Swinney, on the Budget Scotland number no. 5 bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 15693 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 57. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to and the Budget Scotland number 5 bill is passed. I propose to ask a single quick order. I propose to ask a single question on motions number 15715 to 15722. If any member objects a single question being put, please say so now. No member has objected to a single question being put. Therefore, the next question is that motions number 15715 to 15722, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of SSIs, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 15723, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time.
We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.